Surviving and thriving in the competitive business world requires businesses to adopt, adapt and improve every single day. What about the business leaders such as yourself? You need to do that too. And how would you do that with the latest market intel and the global insights, which is exactly what we deliver to you here in Biznomics. I'm Tarun Amara Sekara and welcome to your weekend's most profitable 60 minutes. The knowledge economy, globally valued at more than $50 billion. What exactly are the opportunities and potential for Sri Lankan companies? Would you believe that there are Sri Lankan entities where using the Sri Lankan talent, they provide knowledge services to global organizations and even citizens? That's right. Today our focus will be on this topic and we are in conversation with none other than the CEO of Third Space Global who is Mr. Shemal Jayatilakar. Shemal, welcome to Biznomics. It's an honor to have you with us today. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Shemal, let's cut to the chase here. The knowledge economy. We hear many def different definitions. The World Bank itself provides multiple different descriptions of this. They have even given four pillars of uh, the knowledge economy of which Education and training is one of them, which is, I believe, the space that third space is uh, operating in. That's and correct. let's get to the proper identification of this term, because in a modern world, it's much easier to uh, have so much of misinformation rather than the correct information. I'm sure you'll agree with me on that. <laughs> Absolutely. So what exactly is the knowledge economy and what is the economic value of this worldwide? Okay, so uh, that's a good question. And I think, as you rightly say, there are lots of technical answers that overcomplicate it in, 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 in many ways. But in, in the simplest form, so we have agriculture, manufacturing, and service industries, which are, these are the traditional service industries, of course, new, Correct. Uh, relatively. And it came with these different, uh, what we call the uh, industrial revolutions. Isn't Correct. It? Yeah, agriculture to industry, and then people realize, wait a minute, Knowledge and intellectual uh, capacity is actually the biggest uh, yeah, tool. Correct. So the knowledge economy is something that kind of contributes to all of this. Um, the, the, for me, the foundations of that is the people and uh, the education, right? So because if you, you know, a simple example, if you take uh, agriculture, you can apply the knowledge economy for the development of agriculture, like the scalability of it the improve the technology improvements that you use in agriculture so the knowledge economy is the actual research and development the education that goes into improving the industries or the things we do uh, globally in a very simplified manner that's what it is so globally if you look at uh, you know research and development education the knowledge economy it's expect to be around 350 billion oh, wow. uh, by 2025 Right? But within that, there's a subcomponent, which is this uh, online education. Correct. Right? So getting that education out to people, that's at about, uh, that's spec to be at about 18 uh, billion uh, by 2025. So it's, that, you know, that's a growing trend. So although the knowledge economy per se is defined to be around more than $50 billion, when you add it up with the R&D sector, all that, it's a... It More than three hundred billion yeah, dollars. Exactly. Well, picked to be by twenty twenty five. Not not right now. Um, so so that is the the knowledge economy, and you know within that you have, as I said, education and research, and the part that we pay a lot of attention to is the education side of things, um, and the initiatives, the startup cultures. If you take all, you know, if you if you look at uh, you know any traditional organization, after a certain point, you have diminishing returns. To avoid these diminishing returns, you have to have research and development, you have to have innovation, and that is where the knowledge economy really contributes. And for that, you need education and research, which goes hand in hand. So it's interesting how you laid out the context there, basically, where knowledge economy comes into play, how it's connected with R&D, I think that's why it fits in the big picture, and I think the economic uh, growth potential is tremendous, Shemal. Now, let's talk about, within this knowledge economy, what do you see as the next big wave or the next big opportunity? Is it education? Um, I think education definitely is a, is a huge opportunity because, you know, globally, education is changing. And certainly after the pandemic or during the pandemic, you know, it was forced, you know, that change was forced. Um, 
So if you go back a few years, um, you know, countries like Finland had a very different education system to the rest of the world. That's why, you know, Finnish people tend to score very highly on STEM related subjects compared to the STEM as in science, science technology, technology, engineering, mathematics. mathematics. Correct. And we see a renewed, we'll come to that on data question too, but we do see the entire world focusing on this in a very renewed way. Yes, there, I mean, the, the focus has always been there. Um, I think there is renewed engagement um, or focus because they see that as a, a, a foundational pillar for people to succeed. Shemal, are there any features of this? I, I mean, slightly digressing from the main question, but uh, can, can you share us any certain features of that Finnish education system that made them good at those subjects? So, yes. I think in uh, Sri Lanka right now, if I'm not mistaken, mathematics is a problem. We hear that, you know, the mathematics pass mark is being brought down at mm. some points as well, yeah. which needs to get addressed. So, uh, really good question, and I'm glad you asked that, because it's, so, the Finnish education system, uh, or what is the rest of the world calls alternate education, uh, does not ask a student or a learner to conform to a structure, meaning here's a curriculum, here's what you're supposed to learn at year, you know, two, three, four, five, whatever, here's your syllabus, go learn it. I don't care whether you like it, I don't care if you are a slightly different learner to the other kid, like you're a visual learner, you're a kind of experienced learner, you need to, you know, you're a more tact you know, tactile learner, you have to touch and feel things to learn. I don't really care. Go to a classroom, sit in that classroom and learn. That's what the Finnish education system didn't do. What they did was, in education, the fundamental purpose is learning. If no learning happens, education fails. So what they did was rather than say the student needs to conform to a structured system, the system should conform or adjust to the needs of the student, right? So, uh, you know, it's what you call more individualistic learning or adjusted learning to that particular student. And then what happened was, um, you know, different people. So it's not just that they focus on the STEM. They focused on everything like arts, physical education, like the whole works, right? It was not just like you need to learn maths or science or technology or engineering, you know, like it, it was not just focusing on It was that. more learning oriented than was, just teaching or than exactly, passing exams. Exactly. It was more teaching oriented. It was more, uh, sorry, it was more learning oriented rather than um, saying, you know, here's the, the, here's the times it. table, go memorize it. Mm -hmm. Right, I mean, you have a calculator, you have Google, no, you don't need to memorize a lot of things, right? But You have Siri and so many yeah, exactly. other Exactly, you just nations. have to just tell it to the phone and the phone will give you the answer. But, you know, so what that did was that um, enabled creative thinking. It enabled problem-solving skills. And what it also did was it reduced the number of people that dropped out from school. Understood at, you know, certain stages, uh, you know, later stages in life. Now, if you take countries like Sri Lanka, like, you know, uh, look at most of the three-wheeler drivers in this country. They're young kids who should be in university or doing some kind of education or, or you know, they're wasting their time. You know, of course, there are economical, economic conditions and all these other factors that go into it, but they, you know, that's the talent, that's the future of this country. And Shema, just to add to that now, I agree that they may be schooled about etc. But at the same time, there are so many opportunities in vocational training institutes and all that. You can learn carpentry, you can learn a bit of, uh, you know, motor mechanics, electro electronics. People can learn this, but these guys don't want to go to that. Is it that due to the problems in the education system, they have begun to hate uh, learning? I think it's... Uh I, I can't answer that question. I don't know the answer to that question. It could be that. But I think the problem is also stigma, right? Like, I'm almost 40. Actually, I am 40 next week. But uh, Early birthday. Early, thank 15. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, but, you know, when I was growing up, when I was in school, my parents told me, I need you to be an engineer, a doctor, a lawyer, or any one of these set uh, uh, roles or, or jobs that are, that are prestigious that I should go into. Nobody said, I want, you know, oh, do you want to be a carpenter? You know, do you want to do some creative, uh, you know, work? Sure, 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 go learn that. Hmm. Nobody, nobody 
there's a stigma around those roles. Like, you know, I, I was... But if you're bad in studies, you end up in doing that. Yeah, exactly. So, exactly, exactly. You hit the nail on the head there. Because if you are in any one of those roles, it's because you have failed in something else. Which is the wrong way to approach it. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. So... And just read to what you were saying, Shimon, I have so many friends in Finland. They sometimes give up their full-time lucrative office jobs and they take up carpentry and they build things because they've learned it in school, they know the value of it and they see a bigger market and economic potential exactly. as well. Because you're more passionate about what you do. What you are doing. Exactly. And you and and if you're passionate about something, then you have the ability to apply creative thinking and problem solving. Correct. To add value to what you're doing. Which which comes back to that, you know, how do you innovate and do more in order to uh, you know, uh, move away from those diminishing returns in any organization, in any industry that you may be operating in. Correct. Now, coming back to our question on why you think education is the next big opportunity in the knowledge economy, what is your school of thought there? So I think the, there's, there's a few reasons for that. One is I, uh, education as it stands right now or the industry itself needs to change. As I said, it needs to be more learner-centric rather than institutionalized, you know, institutionalized. So, um, and the other thing is, it needs to, um, uh, it needs to be more, it needs to have customized learning programs, modules, that are currently not available in structured, like in schools. A school is unable to provide, in, as, the, as they are right now, an individualized learning program to a student that allows them to maximize their own potential, learn the way that they best learn to get to where they want to get to. Either you conform to it, if you don't, like, you know, scholarship exams or any exam, A level, O level, whatever. If you don't do well in that, that kind of caps your g progress from there onwards, right? It's like, oh, this guy failed o A levels. So, uh, oh, sorry, O levels. Yeah. And so you can't go anywhere there after that. Shema, so, let me tell you, I'm sure you have the experience as well. You don't have to necessarily uh, fail A level. When I went and told my physics uh, master, look, I passed, <laughs> but there was no A. Yeah. And he was like, why is that? Why did that happen? It was yeah. like the world was coming to an end. Precisely. But, you know, and, and so th this gets us into a slightly deeper kind of waters because there is this, you know, organizations like Third Space Global. For sure. Right? We, we hire online tutors, like maths tutors. We teach primary school students in the UK. But we have to, you know, I can't take someone who's failed their maths O levels Correct. or A levels and be like, well, you can be a maths tutor. But that's not entirely true. You know, if you're 30 years old now and you failed your maths when you were, I don't know, 16, it doesn't necessarily mean that you don't know your maths. It potentially does, but Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes the guy who failed might actually know better on what exactly. went wrong and can help another one to avoid that. Exactly. And also, the other thing is, in, in what we look for, what we look for is, do you have the ability to transfer the knowledge that you have to another person Correct. in a way that that person learns something? Right? So, I mean, we're, 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 I think we are talking about a lot of different uh, things here, but... Such is the fascinating nature of yeah, exactly, knowledge economics. Exactly, the, Once you start talking about it, you, you, know, you can go into all different angles. But, um, so the opportunity. Opportunity, uh, you know, because of all of these reasons, it cre it, there is an opportunity for online learning, for, you know, um, distance learning, or um, learning through other media. Like, for example, kids nowadays learn a lot from YouTube, or, you know, or lynda.com or any one of these uh, tools or even Wikipedia, even though that's not the most uh, best place to learn anything. People read stuff that's on the internet and they have more knowledge about what's happening in the world than they do otherwise. Now, if you are not trained to read, to be inquisitive, to, to investigate. To ask questions. To ask questions, to be creative. I was like, oh, there's a problem. Like, why is that happening? How, how might I solve it? Has anybody else anywhere in the world have solved it? If you don't know to ask those questions and you are just like, well, I've studied my, you know, science, physics book during my O-levels. That's all the knowledge I have. That caps you. That caps your ability, right? So I think that's where the opportunity is. Is creating these tools 
not necessarily online uh, tools, but even like in India, I think during the pandemic, when they went to these remote places, it wasn't technology, was, like internet was not readily available or Correct. the computers were not available. So I think I read somewhere, this is some time ago, that they had a program where they took maths, physical maths, that had, uh, this is for the younger students, that had numbers, alphabets and things like that, and they actually played games in those locations. This is in UK? In, no, in India, in India. In India, so remote parts of India, where they played games that enabled learning. So because they couldn't go to a classroom, they had to do it in open fields, so they didn't have blackboards and things like that. And there was a, a lorry with a loudspeaker that was telling them what to do. And that's how they learned, right? So it doesn't always have to be some new technology like the latest computers or the latest, uh, you know, internet infrastructure, you know, whatever. It can, technology does not mean that. Technology means anything that innovates or changes the way a learner learns to enable education or learning across the board and, and make it more accessible. Because the other problem that, you know, the opportunity that this presents is the learner gap is increasing. Disadvantaged students always fall behind and that gap is increasing and it has increased over the last, you know, 10 years and it's increasing much faster now, right? Because you don't have access to a laptop, good internet or to the tools or the, you know, material that you need to have, whereas a, a person from a more advantageous background has access to all of that and they learn much faster, they're more creative, they, so this gap widens, right? So the, your economic ability or your ability to earn money is a direct reflection of where you stand in this, in this spectrum. If right. you're more to this side, you know, you are doing something menial, something that does not probably add value. Whereas if you're on this end, you're doing more of the research, problem solving, creative thinking, you're in the high echelons of, of society and, and, and the workplace. So that's the opportunity. This um, narrowing this gap, closing this gap. gap is what the opportunity is for this online education, what it presents. Some fantastic thoughts there, Shemal. We are going to continue this discussion in more detail. What excites Shemal and his team about the potential of Sri Lanka for the knowledge economy? Let's talk about that on the other side of this short break. This is Bisnomics. <music> Welcome back to Bisnomics. I'm Tarno Amar Sekara. Our focus today is on the knowledge economy and the economic opportunities and the potential in this global phenomenon for Sri Lanka. And we are in conversation with Mr. Shyamal Jayatilaka. Shyamal, now when we look at your organization, Third Space, that you're involved with, now what was the experience in having this company set up? I know you have got involved as a CEO after some time, but you obviously know the journey of the company. What were the experiences of uh, Third Space? I believe as one of the uh, first movers to this sector in Sri Lanka. Mm. In, in your journey so far, what have you experienced? What are the lessons you have to share? And most importantly, you're building a global knowledge economy entity having faith in the Sri Lankan talent, Sri Lankan minds and brains. What excites you about the Sri Lankan talent? I think that's the second question I would like to ask. I mean, there is a lot to get excited about the Sri Lankan talent. I think, you know, like, um, so in our organization, so let me first of all tell you a bit about the journey. So we started back in 2015 in Sri Lanka. It was founded by uh, Thomas Hooper, who's um, a British uh, person. And um, Roshan Nilavira then was the, uh, the person who uh, uh, started the company in Sri Lanka, Third Space Global. And then um, at that point, it was a new industry, right? So tutoring, hiring people for this particular job, it was a new, it's a new industry. It was almost informal, like. Yeah, it was, you know, like people were curious, but they were also like, is this a career path that I can follow? Like, what does this give me? Is there anything in return that I can get? Because, you know, people want something in return Absolutely. from the job that they the do, right? Fundamentals of economics. Exactly. No such thing as a free lunch. Free lunch, exactly, precisely. So, um, so at the beginning, for the first, I think, three, four years, uh, till, till about 2018, it was more around getting the, the base right, creating a, um, you know, creating a uh, culture where you're more learner focused. Because, you know, you take a Sri Lankan who's gone through the traditional education system here 
and get them in to train a student in the UK, the approach they take is very different. So you have to break them from the traditional learning mindset to a more reflective learning mindset, you know, where you're adjusting and adapting to the student's needs as the lesson progresses, right? And, and also the other part is creating, uh, you know, learning modules, creating the infrastructure that gives the tutor and the student a better platform to work with. So as an organization. And now if you look at it now, we have about almost a thousand tutors in Sri Lanka. Uh, we have a, a whole bunch of tutors in India. We have about 160 non-tutoring roles in Sri Lanka. And a majority of those non-tutoring roles have come through former tutors, right? So, and the tutors themselves are, you know, we have, I think 80% of our tutoring population is female, spread across island-wide. Like in 2018, we were based, from 2015 to 2018, we were physically based in an office. In 2018, I started saying, oh no, if we really want to use the knowledge that's available in the country, we have to take this opportunity to people who are unable to come to one location in Colombo. So let's go work from home. This is well before COVID or Easter Sunday. Two years Sun before COVID. Two years before COVID, before Easter Sunday, all of those things, right? So in 2018, December, I remember I ran the pilot. And there was an overwhelming sense of appreciation from the, from the staff, from the tutors that said, oh, well, I can actually work from home now and do the same job that I did before. So creating the infrastructure for that. So, you know, you, that's the skill. That's the skill of the person, the adaptability of the person to adapt to that environment, to that need. And as I said, today, all our tutors work from home. All thousand work from home. And we have tutors from ac across the country, you know, that do quite well for themselves. Um, and people who do non-tutoring rules who also work from, uh, you know, around the country. So there is a massive amount of knowledge that can be leveraged provided you give them the right platform to do so. Most of my technology staff or analytics staff or, uh, you know, the marketing people essentially have come from, you know, you have to identify what are you passionate about and then put them into that space and then you know, they kind of carry the weight thereafter. And as a tutor, if you are passionate about that student's progress, if you, have, if you have a vested interest in making sure that that student builds a relationship with you uh, and that you want to make sure that that person succeeds, which Sri Lankans are very good at, by the way. We're very, you know, we, we take personal pride in the achievements of others. I think that's something I've seen in, in our company. That's why it yeah. feels very sad when you lose a cricket match, isn't it? Oh my God, <laughs> trust me, it's devastating. <laughs> but even, even though we potentially know what the outcome is, we're still devastated. Um, so, you know, I think that's where, the, uh, that's where the, that's the secret sauce, in that passion that people have to, to do what they do, not just because they get paid at the end of the day, not just because it's a job, it's, it's a contractual job, but they're passionate about getting that other other person to succeed. Probably also because um, when you take the role of teaching, it's something that is quite respected and almost revered, isn't it? I mean, we've, we've always yeah. developed a culture in Sri Lanka where teachers are seen as the next parents. Yeah. And uh, probably that also adds up. So some interesting thoughts uh, there. Let's get back to this topic you mentioned, STEM, hmm. science, technology, education, and mathematics, because I think now no matter what job people do, even if it's like a business management related job, still STEM is coming into the picture with all these technologies and all these aspects coming in. It's hard to think of a job role that is not affected by the need to have proper uh, STEM related insights and STEM education. So if you look at uh, in this aspect, do you find that in this modern world, in this modern business context and education context that Sri Lankans are skilled enough in these STEM areas to be a part of the global knowledge economy where the opportunities for STEM education is there? I think we, are certainly, we certainly have the skill set. Uh, but what we lack across the board is that creative thinking, is that problem-solving mindset. More often than not, um, when we interview people for the jobs that we do, we find that they have a very fixed mindset, meaning that what I know is the truth, I'm not willing to deviate from this mindset that I have that 
you know, I think I'm really, really good. If you give me feedback, you're probably mistaken. So that fixed mindset limits the possibilities of a really good, uh, you know, person with a really good STEM background. Because a STEM background on its own does not give you, you know, create the opportunities that you that you want. Correct. You need to have, you need to be uh, empathetic. You need to be emotionally intelligent. You need to be a good communicator, right? So, you know, how often do we, um, you know, how often do we in schools promote communication? Communication doesn't mean that, okay, you and I are having a conversation. It means that I have to adapt and adjust to how you are talking to me and, and vice versa, right? Correct. So we don't necessarily instill those um, um, traits and those uh, disciplines at the in school. In fact, I believe uh, it's most of the opposite, isn't it? I mean, most of the time in schools, what we are heard telling is don't talk. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> while the lessons are going on. Uh, but, uh, you know, so you have to... It's not just the STEM. Uh, it's not just learning mathematics, physics, science, chemist uh, chemistry, or, or biology, or anything like that. It's how do you use that knowledge to generate interest, generate um, passion, uh, so that you're willing to take on things that that are problematic, right? Like the the, the fertilizer issue in the country, like. You know, there are so many talented people in this country that potentially have solutions, but then probably not, you know, they're not probably looking at it in that way. They're like, oh, this is a problem. I'll move on to the next thing that's less of a problem. So, you know. The more you run away from a problem, you lose the chance to solve a problem which generates new knowledge. Correct. And innovate and brings you more money and, you know, makes you wealthy and all of those things come with it, right? So we lack that. So it's not a case of the fundamental technical knowledge. It's the most soft skill. Uh, I hate using the word soft skills, but it's more around that. I think nowadays the word is life skills. Life skills, yes, that's a better word. I, I hate the word soft skills. I think life skills is what people people lack, and we find that. And I'm sure other companies do this, uh, find this as well. If we find it a lot when we interview people, so they have extremely good grades. They've done really well in their school studies and everything, but they lack that human um, connection or that. Um, human dynamics when it comes to succeeding. So you need to have a balance of both. Makes sense. From a government perspective, and you being an entrepreneur in the knowledge economy, you being a player in the knowledge economy, what are the initiatives you would like to see or the policies you would like to see from the side of the government that will help Sri Lanka to be a much more relevant uh, player in the knowledge economy. I can see the wry smile. <laughs> it kind of is telling me there's a lot they can do, but I'm wondering whether they even know the potential. But yeah. tell us so, what your thoughts are on that. Part. So there are, there are some, some basic infrastructure related things that can happen. For example, I told you we have a thousand, close to a thousand tutors working across Sri Lanka, Correct. working from home. Now, on the other side, I have customers in the UK who expect a certain service. Now imagine if my tutor working from home, while a session's going on with the school on the other end, there's no power, right? Um, and we see this a lot. So I have to invest a lot of effort and money to overcome some basic infrastructure needs that shouldn't even be, a, should, shouldn't even be something that we have to uh, you know, spend so much effort and money on. Yeah. Um, so that, you know, having a stable infrastructure to grow and develop this type of business is one. The other is, I think, uh, and progressively has gotten worse, is the internet. Penetration, as well as in places where there is internet, it's not of good quality, right? I think, I think unfortunately, we have been ranked among some, one of the countries with the worst level of internet connectivity. Yeah, especially when it comes to latency. Like, I think 26 milliseconds or something is our average latency, which is terrible. Like, it's supposed to be about two, three milliseconds at best, right? So, um, you know, so, and also not just that, but the penetration. So we have, you know, the, the infrastructure development that will allow for education across the country, but also being part of the knowledge economy. Like, as you say, we have not just Third Space Global, there are lots of other companies that are in this space, right? That are doing, that are doing things for the, you know, bringing in foreign revenue. Yeah. 
move we are well essentially it. bringing in we are bringing revenue. a lot of foreign revenue right like you know but and that's what the country needs right now as well precisely so but if you don't have this type of infrastructure that enables it that supports it um, where do you go from there right um, and also like technology equipment like if you you know if a person how many people in sri lanka can afford to buy a laptop forget that how many people can afford to buy a smartphone right like i know we have we say we have so many devices uh, that are available and 30% but, penetration or uh, yeah exactly but you know what what's the what's the you know the is it universally the case no right and even if you do have a smartphone you probably don't have your data on all the time or you know you're not actively engaging it it's just like a uh, fashion statement more than anything else um and the other is incentives i think you need to have policies that are that incentivizes uh research teachers we've seen problems in the recent past right so you know how do you if you you know you've mentioned this you said teachers are second only to parents um it was certainly the case when we were in school i don't know how old you are but <laughs> certainly when i was in school <laughs> but close close by give or take <laughs> five to 10 this way that way <laughs> five to ten okay uh, but uh, i don't know if that's the case now right i don't know if that same respect mm. you know because it, as a teacher in order to have respect you need to respect yourself and i you know seeing what's happened in the last I think few months uh, half a year you know it it, it does not um, paint a rosy picture exactly and uh, so those are things i think and also from a, a another thing from a policy perspective for organizations like us like kpo even bpo type organizations is global you know there's the global data protection act right uh, GDPR. gdpr requirements uh, now there are only certain countries that conform to gdpr requirements for you know when you're working with european countries or american america there is there are certain requirements that you need to conform to correct sri lanka does not have those policies in place to give the confidence to a, a, a organization or an, a, a country to want to work with us come and set up set up operations operations uh, because we don't have the policies that so as an organization we have to do a lot have lots of policies uh, you know frameworks in place to overcome those shortfalls Understood. shortcomings Understood. so you know that's what can happen uh, from a you know what the government can do oh what what the certainly sounds like a lot and let's hope uh, that these ideas are heard by them and they take the necessary steps let's see let's see um jamal um, we are going to come back to you on more details on yeah. that one stay tuned we will be back after this short break this is biznomics Welcome back to Biznomics, your weekend's most profitable 60 minutes. We are in conversation with Mr. Shyamal Jayatilaka on the potential opportunities of the knowledge economy for Sri Lanka. Shyamal, now let's talk about distance learning because you've been practicing it for a long time. It was new to Sri Lanka, especially mm. when uh, COVID-19 hit, but now I guess it's becoming the norm than the, uh, the rare instance. My question to you is this whole distance e-learning, which you're operating across the globe, is it really working what is the message that the stats are giving us all yours to demystify um it's it's not really very mysterious it's uh, essentially distance learning does work provided you have the right infrastructure support so as i was talking earlier if you take the disadvantaged students globally meaning people who don't have access to technology internet you know that type of that segment of people students they make about 8 to 10 they come down 8 to 10% you know from where they were with even with the distance learning whereas the people who are from more advantageous backgrounds they make about 40 to 60% improvement with distance learning from where they were because with distance learning what happens is like for example what we do is it's individualistic you don't you don't like you know it's not like sitting in a zoom classroom where a teacher is just talking to 30 students and telling them you know here's what it is true distance learning is that you know gamified individualistic learning that will drive the learner 
to gain more knowledge as they engage with it. So, you know, there is, I want to qualify that. It's, you know, distance learning does not mean that you sit in a Zoom classroom and, I mean, I'm sure people will learn in that as well, yeah. but it depends on, you know, if you are an engaged learner, you will do well. But, you know, if you're, and especially if you're a young child, uh, you know, maybe less than 10 years old, who's constantly distracted by the dog running around or the, you know, or the toy that's on the ground, you're not going to learn. That's, that's not going to work. So the environment, the technology needs to be in a way that enables that learner to learn. Mm. Uh, so it does work, but it's not that it works all the time, everywhere, universally. It needs to be uh, relevant for that particular learning scenario. When you talk about EdTech, once again, we see so many global brands entering this space, even some of the brands of Disney and all that have already entered this arena. What are the technologies of EdTech that excites you as a CEO of a, you know, education related uh, organization? Mm. So I mean, I, there's a lot of technology that, uh, you know, has amazing potential. Um, especially I think gamified learning is, is one of them, uh, personally for me, is um, where, you know, you, you are taken through a journey that in, that's, that's unique to you to get to the same place that everyone else is getting to, but you take your own path. Right? For example, I'm sure you are aware these days there's this famous game called Wordle. Ah, yes, it's where my, lots of my friends yeah. play it. I, I, I wait till 12 o'clock in the night <laughs> to play that because they give you the uh, you, they give you six chances to guess the word. Yeah. You Based on how you enter it, they show what letters are there Correct. in the right place, not in the right place. Exactly. And I, I think that's a fantastic way of uh, learning words. And this is what gamified learning is, right? I mean, that's an example of gamified learning. So... Um, so that's, I, I think, creating... Gamification yeah, one technology. Yeah, gamification is one, one technology. And the, lots of examples of that. And the other is, um, is um, things like uh, AI-based learning or augmented reality learning, right? So there are you... Because lots of people, some people are very spatial in their learning needs. They, they want to experience things, right? They can't read a book and absorb. They have to see it, Um you know, I, I remember when I, when, I, when I learned to drive, changing gears was a difficult concept for me. But until I found out what actually changing the gears does to the car, you know, clutch balance, how that... So once I realized, oh, this is the mechanism, this is what happens if I don't do it properly, yeah. I was like, oh, okay, now I know what to do. So, you know, it was just like a switch going off. Yeah, that's a very simplistic example of different, different learning traits or different learning attitudes of people. Understood. So, uh, so, you know, augmented reality, AI-based technology where, uh, you know, you're talking to a person like a bot, like a Siri or something, that's trying to understand how this person understands a concept or me, how I understand a concept and they're adjusting their learning method to that. Understood. So, Let's talk about data analytics. What is the role of data analytics in the whole uh, distant learning um, business model here, Shemal? Because I believe that each student that learns from you is data. Each session is data. Tutors are data. Right? Yeah. The conversations are data. Yeah. Right? So I believe that when you are tailoring the education experience according to the need of that particular student, I believe data analytics has to be playing a crucial role in that. Am I right or am I absolutely right? You are uh, double absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> so I think data analytics or uh, you know, analytics plays an important role in anything. If any industry, any you know, agriculture to manufacturing to everything data analytics play, plays a vital role because it's, it's the learning that allows you to adjust what you do to do it better the next time around. So to remove the you know, to, to change that diminishing returns type of curve. Um, in education, as you correctly point out, there is a lot of information that can be drawn out from how a student behaves, how they progress through lessons. Like, I'll, I'll take a very practical example for us, right? So, we uh, did this exercise where we broke down our lessons into its most basic components. So if you take place value, for example, we broke it down to its most basic component. And then we 
uh, took the learner through the tutor and the learner through that particular module. Now, when that like so, if you have let's say thousands of lessons, those small modules, and if you have a thousand tutors, if you know that okay, on average, place value this particular model, our thousand tutors complete it within one to one point one lessons or one point two lessons, like averaged out. Yeah. But if you then know there's ten tutors or a hundred fifty tutors that are taking two lessons or perhaps even two and a half lessons to complete the same module, that's information, right? Because is it because those tutors did not get the right knowledge or don't lack the right knowledge to communicate that particular module? Is it because the students they are teaching don't understand that lesson in a certain way, right? Um, or uh, like similarly, if you find that a particular lesson everyone is taking longer to complete, they can't complete it in one lesson. That uh, it, you know, on ninety percent of them are taking more than one and a half to two lessons. Then you potentially know well that's probably a problem with the lesson itself. We may need to break it down further. Right. Um, so you know, there are so many learnings or, or changes that you can adopt for the tutor, for the kind of training you provide, for the kind of tutor you recruit for the kind of um, uh, support that you give them while the lesson's going on, before the lesson starts. To the student to say, well, do we, should we have different types of lessons for the same type of student? Oh, sorry, different types of students, right? Or do we take the same lesson, but have a completely different method of communicating that lesson to the different types of students? And, um, you know, what is the best way to structure the lessons themselves into a way that, you know, that is its most basic component that we can assess and uh, understand if a student's making progress. So, analytics is, I mean, the name of the game. You have to have a really good uh, analytics function. In to, your day. Yeah. On a final note, uh, Shema, let's talk about uh, promoting Sri Lanka as a destination for this knowledge economy for providing education services, tutoring, and so on. How can we really position Sri Lanka? Because I believe India is coming into this game. They've got their skin in the game Huge. in a big way. Hmm. And so have some of the other... Philippines uh, uh, is another Philippines, one. exactly. And they already had a massive uh, footprint in it, especially through some of the other knowledge uh, process outsourcing, such as secretarial services, accountancy hmm. services, and so on. Now, how can Sri Lanka make sure that they don't fall behind and that we too uh, get our name out there. What needs to be done, Shyamal? So there's a, the, as I mentioned, the certain policies with regards to how, uh, you know, we respond to GDPR or how we are compliant with global regulations needs to be looked at. So have countries like Philippines done that? Yeah, I mean, I mean, so um, they they are more um, uh, they are more open to the kind of regulations that uh, other countries need to conform to, and they are they are willing to adjust to it. Um, whereas I think Sri Lanka has a fairly fixed mindset when it comes to, oh no, this is what we have, we are not willing to change our policies, uh, or they're very slow to change the policies. Um, then the other thing is um, the kind of employment laws that you have, right? We have, I think our uh, employee laws are uh, a few decades old. They haven't really changed. It does not... Uh, you know, when we started with uh, having contractors, you know, we really had to work hard to, you know, build a framework for contractors to be able to work and do good work with us. So, um, creating an environment that other companies, global companies, want to come and invest their money here, because the talent is there, the skill is there, right? It's a platform that's a bit wobbly right now. So, well, what you said, Anana, I believe our local O-level and even local A-level mathematics, or even the London O-level and London A-level mathematics syllabuses, once you've been through that, even a guy who might marginally fail still has a pretty good knowledge. Yeah, because I, th you know, I mean, Sri Lankans are smart. I'm not saying that because I'm Sri Lankan, but, you know, we are, Sri Lankans are very talented. We are a talented group of people, and uh, it's, it's, it's giving a platform for that talent to, to do well. And if you look at most of the KPO, BPO industries, like, um, you know, I used to work for HSBC, uh, data processing in uh, Rajagiri, a, 
I started in 2004 working there, it was very difficult for us to attract people at that time because it was there was a stigma. It was like, oh, BPO, that's not a that's not an that's engineer. That's not a good job. That's not that's not a lawyer. That's not a you know. So that's not. But then if you look at now, there's yeah. a wider acceptance of it. Correct. Correct. So education, I think, the education industry, the industry that we are in, is also going through that same transformation, right? And it will get to a point where, you know, you see real movers and shakers coming from Sri Lanka, both in the tech space, coming up with new technologies, right. but also in terms of the skill set, the knowledge, the experience in, in dealing with uh, or, or taking education to the, to the world. So um, we just need to get a few things right at, at a policy. Hopefully sooner than later. That's the, that's the hope. Shriyamal Jayatilaka, thank you so much for joining us today, sharing your thoughts on this industry and we wish you and the team at Third Space all the best to uh, make sure that uh, you guys continue to uh, ensure that Sri Lanka plays a key role in the global knowledge economy and may more entities be inspired by you and uh, have more and a stronger footprint in this uh, knowledge economy worldwide. Thank you for joining us. and Thank you, all you the for best. having me. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. No matter what industry you may be in, if you are an investor, make sure you're considering the possibilities of the knowledge economy. Sri Lanka has the talent. With a few more things to be corrected, I'm quite sure that sooner than later, we will be a considerable force to reckon with in the global knowledge economy. I'm Thalang Gomara Sekar, and no matter what business you may be in, have a profitable week ahead. This is Bisnomics.